Hi friends, Lorelai Black from Blade and Broom and this week we are going to be talking about spirits. So this is a topic near and dear to my heart, uh, but one that I find that sometimes is a little bit difficult for people to talk about. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that that I'm excited about going into uh, both why people find it a little tricky to talk about their spirit relationships and also how those spirit relationships manifest. So let's dive in. So first off, let's talk about the fact that spirit relationships and the witch go back for as long as we have records of witchcraft, really. The idea of a familiar spirit or a spirit familiar to me as a witch or a, f a spirit that is known to me or to you as a practitioner of the arts is something that we see all the way back to antiquity. So you see, um, you see accounts of it in, um, in stories of sorcerers and witches and, and magicians and practitioners of the occult arts all the way back to ancient times, back to um, biblical accounts, uh, if you want to look there for information, but you see it, um, you see it in uh, Sumerian lore and Babylonian lore. Um, so back to really our, like our earliest writings about sorcery and about craft. Uh, they weren't necessarily calling it witchcraft, they were calling it sorcery or calling it by some other name. Um, but we see it there. We see people talking about the spirits that they had encounters with um, or other people talking about the spirits that those people had encounters with um, and how those spirits informed and empowered the work of the practitioner. And then we see that coming forward all the way through history and all the way through folklore and all the way through legend and myth um, from um, from all of world culture, we see practitioners of our arts engaged with spirits. And those relationships take on a lot of different flavors, um, which I've mentioned in, uh, in other places throughout the videos. It's kind of sprinkled in here and there um, throughout all of the videos that I've done so far. There have been like little places where spirits have sort of popped up and said, oh yeah, and spirit work, um, because that's sort of how it is with witches and with spirits. The spirits are just sort of always there with us. And um, some people though feel very uncomfortable even acknowledging that they have those spirit relationships. Um, and some people don't recognize that they have those spirit relationships because they just think about them in terms of ancestor work or they think of them in terms of um, tutelary gods and goddesses, or they think of them in some other um, category or, or grouping. And other people feel awkward talking about them because they think it's going to make them sound crazy <laughs> to say, you know, I have this spirit that I'm very close with and that I get information from, but it, it doesn't fit within a modern context, within a very scientific modern world that we live in to say, oh yeah. Um, you know, Baal talks to me <laughs> and I get, um, you know, I've gotten all this great wealth of information. I get guidance from this goetic spirit that I talk to or from this um, classically known spirit that, you know, get, has been documented from trial records from the Middle Ages. I talk with that one, you know, they called him Malkin back then, but, you know, I talk with that one too or Piwacket or whatever. Um, or maybe it's not one that has a name that is familiar to everybody else, but is still someone that you know and that you work with. And so it feels very private and personal and it makes us feel like we're in jeopardy to share that. There are other reasons for it too. And the other reasons include that if that spirit has shared their name with you, that is a source of power over that spirit. It can be a source of power over that spirit. And there's a lot of lore that says that if a spirit shares their name with you, um, that you then have control over that spirit. Um, and we're going to talk in a little bit about right relationship with a spirit and the fact that you shouldn't be going into a relationship with a spirit that you're trying to control. Um, that's my opinion. And that's the opinion of a lot of folks. 
Um, but there is certainly a lot of uh, lore in the grimoires about how to control and command spirits. Um, save that thought because we're going to come back to it. Um, that's not I'm not into that, but we're going to talk about how a lot of folks historically have engaged in that type of practice in terms of spirit work. So a lot of us do sort of keep the information about which spirits we're working with a little bit guarded, um, or we'll use nicknames for them or pet names for them, something that is publicly accessible, but is not the actual name that the spirit has given us to um, to call them if we want to call upon them. So there are a lot of reasons sort of for keeping our, our spirit work a little bit closely guarded. Falls under that umbrella of the powers of the Sphinx, the powers of the witch, to know, to will, to dare, and to keep silent. Sometimes this information feels a little feels a little more powerful, feels a little safer if we just sort of keep silent about it. But as a teacher of the craft and as somebody who wants to bring information out to people, I just talk about it. So <laughs> we're just talking about it right now. I like to say, um, and this is not something that I came up with, this is, this is a phrase that's been around, but I like to say that we are not um, physical beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. And so it is not so difficult for us um, to, to reach out to the spirit world. Um, and once we sort of frame our experience in that way, that we are spiritual beings who have a physical existence, we're able to recognize that these other spiritual beings are just sibling entities who are not having a a physical experience, um, but they're not so dissimilar from us. Um, they take different forms and they have different perspectives and different information to share. They have different uh, things that they can tap into and that is able to provide guidance and insight for us um, in ways that can be of great benefit. So one of the things that um, that I want to mention is as we're talking about familiars and familiar spirits, is that um, a lot of witches think just of their cat Fluffy or of their dog Fido as they're familiar. And I am not going to take away from that experience from you in any way, but I would like for you to be able to contextualize that as your corporeal familiar. And maybe you have more than one. Maybe you've got um, an animal in your home that is acting um, in the capacity of a guardian, and maybe another one that acts in the capacity of a healer. So I'll use Fuff Fluffy and Fido as examples again. Um, we'll say that Fluffy is a fearsome guard cat and stands as a guardian every time you cast Circle. Maybe you've noticed that. Every time that you um, take up energy work of any kind, Fluffy is right there. You're, you're pulling your tarot cards, Fluffy presents their self and plops right down, possibly even on your cards, and says, magic is being done, I am here to assist. Um, and I am here to make sure that nothing enters this space that should not be here. I am the magical guard cat. So um, that is an aspect that you may be seeing where you know for sure Fluffy is very uh, attracted to um, that energy. And then you've got Fido, the ever loyal, very healing um, nurse dog, who anytime somebody is ill in the home, and maybe especially you because you've got this great bond, Fido is right there, um, ready to lay their head on your lap, at your feet, is just right there with the love and the attention and the support um, all throughout uh, your illness or your blues or whatever may be going on, like whether it's emotional um, malaise that's happening or um, a spiritual disconnect that's happening or 
any kind of physical illness. Um, Fido, the, the healing familiar, is right there on hand with the psychic bowl of soup, <laughs> you know, ready to go. So those are examples where you may be seeing that energetic work that your corporeal familiars are right on hand to do. And those are just a couple of the roles that we can see familiars taking part in. But you may also have more than one spirit familiar that's helping you out in these areas. We are not limited to just one, whether it's corporeal or incorporeal, that discarnate, that those spirits that are not in a fleshy body. So, um, just like you can have more than one friend, you know, you're not limited to just one buddy in this world. You can have more than one spirit friend as well. So um, for some of you, you're like, duh, of course, Lorelai, I know I can have more than one friend, even spiritual friends, even spirit friends. I know I can have lots of them and I do. You should see my spirit court or my spirit tribe or whatever it is that you call this group of familiars. Others of you are gonna be like, mind blown, I can have so many. That explains why I'm getting a little bit harassed by, uh, by this new one and I can't get them out of my mind and I'm always thinking about them but I already had this relationship with this other one and I thought I wasn't allowed to have two. I thought I could only have one familiar. Nope, you can have definitely more than one. Um, you can have a lot and what you'll find is that it's that it is like that concept of a spirit court or a spirit tribe where you can just have lots of different spirits that are fulfilling different roles and as long as you're holding up your end of the bargain whatever that bargain is and again we're going to talk about that here in just a second um then it's all cool right so as long as you're not making arrangements that you can't fulfill um, you're good. So let's talk about what those arrangements might be because it sounds kind of nefarious and it sounds like you're making deals with the devil. Um, and we're going to talk about that concept of the devil probably in another episode too because I've mentioned that as a term a few times already. It's more of a title um, and a way of the world looking at, at entities and beings that we work with and that we love um, and them demonizing. But anyway, in terms of deals, we're really talking about reciprocity and we're talking about everybody getting something out of the relationship. And if you think about any relationship in your life, there should be reciprocity there, right? You don't want to be in any kind of friendship or any kind of romantic relationship or any kind of family relationship where it's entirely one-sided where you're the one giving and giving and giving and the other person takes and takes and takes and you feel like you're getting nothing in return. You're not getting the attention that you deserve. You're not getting the understanding, the companionship. You're not getting the thank yous. You know, you're not getting the gratitude. If you're not getting anything for your time and attention and care and devotion of that other side of the relationship, you eventually leave it. And you might even burn it to the ground, <laughs> right? So, you know, you're going to walk away from that with hard feelings. It's the same in a spirit relationship. It should be the same in a spirit relationship. If this spiritual entity is bringing you love, joy, companionship, you know, if they're being your friend, your, your non-corporeal, you know, your disincarnate best friend and just being there for you, giving you advice, they should be getting something in return for that. If they are helping you solve problems with your job, helping you solve problems with your relationship, helping you solve financial issues in your life, bringing you solutions, helping you make things happen and manifest the reality that you want, they should be getting compensated for that in some way. And they're usually going to be pretty clear about what kind of compensation they want. Um, and most of the time, I would say, if the spirit is a true 
spirit that's going to have affinity with you, meaning it's going to be a good working relationship, what they're going to ask for is not going to be something shocking that you don't want to deliver on. So it's going to be something like making offerings to them on a regular basis of things that you're capable of giving. It could be a range of things. Um, it can be food. It can be, um, and sometimes they'll be really specific about what those food things are. I've worked with spirits who want you to dance for them. I've worked with spirits who want, um, who want you to laugh for them, like genuinely find reasons to laugh for and with them and to give them back that joy. Um, other spirits want you to mention them and to put, for instance, their sigil out into the world and to say, hey, I work with this great guy or this great gal or this great entity and you should know about them. Like they want you to do a little bit of promotion for them because they don't have the the issues with keep my name secret, keep me out of the media. They're on the other side of it like, hey, you know, it would be really great if you promoted me. That would be awesome. I want that, you know, so a little tit for tat in that regard. So it's just, it's all over the place as far as what they want, but they're not going to be asking you to do something that you find unethical or immoral. So then we have questions about where do spirits come from? We see different types of spirits. Um, people talk about familiar spirits coming from, for instance, uh, the Goetia, the Lesser Key of Solomon. And I've worked with um, a few different spirits from the Goetia. And for some people, that's terrifying. Like they think, oh my gosh, you're really into some evil, terrifying things. No, like just no. Um, <laughs> A, there's just so much historically that you need to understand about the Lesser Key of Solomon um, and the spirits of the Legion, which is how they have told me that they prefer to be referenced. Uh, Goetia actually is a Greek word that um, has a couple of different interpretations to it. One means the howling and one means like low magic or sorcery. In general, those spirits don't find that to be the most flattering term is what I've been told by them. So <laughs> um, some of the spirits with whom I have a very close working bond come from that group of 72 spirits. And what I'll say is that there are some that I would not go messing with because I don't think that they have a person's best interest at heart, like really any person's best interest at heart. And then there are others that I think are very helpful, friendly spirits that do indeed have quite a lot to offer to people with whom they have an affinity. Um, and so um, it really just is a matter of the right fit. Uh, but it's like being friends with anybody. I make a great friend <laughs> to people with whom I'm going to make a great friend. Um, and there are other people who are like, Lorelai, that bitch, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> stay away from her. So, I mean, really, like, it just depends on your experience and what you're drawn to and, um, and what your needs are. So, um, and it's the same with the sort of the historical familiars that you see having been named in the trial records throughout the Middle Ages. And by the way, there's some overlap there. So there are some of those Goetic familiars that popped up by name in the trial records. And there are some of those Goetic familiars that you actually see as um, being gods and goddesses and Loa and Orishas from you know, other parts of the world. So we see these same spirits. There's just um, these same spirits sort of pop up in different places and different times going, hey, I'm here, I'm gonna work with you. Hey, I've got stuff to offer and stuff to teach. And if you're interested and if you can hear me, we're gonna get some shit done. So that's one of the reasons why it's not a worthwhile thing just to write out the 72 um, from the Legion just because they're in that book. But our 
familiar spirits can come from lots of different places, not just those sort of known and named spirits from from trial records and grimoires and not just um, the Lesser Key of Solomon, but other grimoires are filled with spirit names. Um, but those spirits can come from nature. Um, the Fae and the She and, and not just those sort of Celtic names of, of different types of nature spirits, but, you know, the entire globe is filled with nature spirits from all types of different cultures. So maybe there's one local to you that's trying to reach out and has a different name than, than something Celtic. There's animal and plant spirit allies uh, that act as very powerful uh, spirit familiars in the same way that Fluffy and Fido that I mentioned earlier can be corporeal familiars. They can act as guardians and healers and guides and, and all of those things on the other side of the veil as well. And then there are spirits of place as well. So again, the globe is filled with spirits of place that are attached to particularly potent rocks or trees or meadows or lakes, rivers, springs, caves, um, just all of those kinds of places. And then there's the spirit of your home itself. Um, and in some cultures that is seen as a spirit that goes with you as a part of your family and in some places that is seen as a spirit that is indwelling in the house and in some places you've got one of each so um, you know you've got these spirits that are that are there and readily accessible to you already again I say we live in a world filled with spirits who are there to help and advise and guide sometimes trick and challenge um, so there's a um, there's a give and take with this and a and a being cautious but also learning to communicate so that we can you know genuinely interact within this world that I'm talking about so there are a lot of different types of familiar spirits in terms of like where they might come from and then there are a lot of different roles that those spirits may play. So I mentioned, I'm going to go back to Fluffy and Fido, um, and I mentioned guardians and healers. There are also other kinds of roles that they might take on. So um, we've got teachers and uh, or advisors or counselors, and these names vary by tradition. So um, you can use the names that I use and that's fine. <laughs> um, some of this is just names that are in sort of instinctively um, what I call them and some of them are names that I picked up along the way working in psychic shops and um, and that type of thing talking with spiritualists um, who come from other traditions so um, use what's comfortable to you uh, the names don't matter as much as the roles that they're actually fulfilling in your life so um, guardians healers teachers gatekeepers those spirits that help you um, decide whether or not you're going to let a new spirit in. So they kind of like keep them at the edge of the perimeter until you decide whether or not um, you're going to let them in to the court, as it were, into the tribe. Um, and if you do medium work at all, if you do channeling, if you do um, that possessory type of work, your gatekeeper is probably going to be a really strong presence in your life and in your spirit court. Also, if you do divinatory work for other people especially that gatekeeper is going to be taking a really strong presence during that work as well um, because your spirits are interacting with their spirits usually very much on that whether you're aware of it or not a lot of times that's a thing that's definitely happening is that their spirits are coming forward with information and saying hey by the way they've got this issue going on that you need to know about and it's getting filtered through um, through these spirits talking to each other, their spirits and your spirits. And the gatekeepers are often the ones that are like letting the information out on that side and letting it in on your side. So um, having a good strong gatekeeper is very helpful for that because then you don't get overly bombarded with the negative things that you might not want to be having penetrating your shields. There are spirits that are just associated with bringing you joy as well. So 
Um, and I think that these are some really important ones for remembering that we've got and that exist during times like these that we are going through right now. So joy guides or joy spirits, joy familiars are the ones um, who do little things just to bring a smile to your face. So um, I think within witchcraft, these don't get talked about nearly enough, but within um, spiritual spiritualist communities and the psychic community at large, you, you see a lot more about joy guides, you hear a lot more about joy guides. Um, but these are the ones where if you're just sort of um, walking along and you have that random thought of that thing that made you laugh uh, last week or a month ago or a year ago, and then it makes you laugh out loud again, that was probably your joy guide. Or if you you know, see something on the side of a bus or you see something in a magazine and again it triggers that um, that funny joke that your friend told you or um, that funny story that happened when you were in college um, and it gives you those warm fuzzies. That was, that was your joy guide. So um, they just want to see us happy. Um, they're the ones that waft that smell of, you know, freshly baked brownies or whatever it is that you particularly get those, like, that dopamine hit from, <laughs> even when that thing is not physically in your presence, but you kind of, like, get that etheric smell of it and you just sort of, like, bliss out for a second. That's them. So, sometimes we don't have good strong names for those um, for those spirits, we just, we call them something like joy or something like that. So, um, so that's one. And then another type of spirit, uh, that again, I don't think we always think about, um, within traditional craft, but a lot of us have and have very strongly on our sides, especially if we're excellent at manifesting, is a runner. And I've heard different names for this, but runner is the name that I use for this type of spirit. The runner is the spirit who secures resources in the local physical world. So um, they're the ones who are really good at getting you that parking space right up front. Every, like if you're the person that is um, and I laugh because I am that person who's like really, really good at getting the right up front parking spot at Costco every time you go. Um, that's, that's your runner spirit. Um, if you have that good relationship with your runner and um, you can basically go, I really need to get like an extra X amount of money. And then um, like within hours or days, that money just like finds its way to you, you know, through like easy methods. It's just suddenly there, like you just made an extra sale on something or, um, you know, your bank gives you an extra little kickback on your account for, for no evident reason. Um, that's your runner. Teacher spirits are those, um, gosh, that's funny. Being a teacher, you'd think that I'd mentioned teachers first. Um, Teacher spirits are those spirits that bring you new information and help you process it. So they're the ones that inspire you to do late night Google dives on the internet where you just dive deep and get all the information. Or they're the ones that like pop new information into your head where you're like, how did I know this thing? I didn't know this thing before. And now suddenly you just have new information. One of my spirits is, um, very much a teacher spirit and she brings a lot of information to me through um, what I call spirit writing. It's basically a form of automatic writing. Um, but instead of me like not looking at the page, I look at the page, but I basically just like turn my conscious brain off and let my hand do the writing. And like, I haven't caught up to what I'm writing until later in the process. Um, and, um, she brings me all kinds of information that like maybe I came across it somewhere, but I was not conscious that I knew it. And the other way that she brings me information is through talking boards or Ouija boards. And there have been so many things where, especially working with a partner, so much information has come through that we've been able to verify 
after the fact that neither myself nor the other party had any idea about. Um, again, like maybe we overheard somebody at some point 10, 20 years ago talking about this thing, but, um, but I don't discredit that as being a way that new valid information comes to you because I would never have accessed that if it hadn't been for the spirit helping to bring that up. So um, teacher guides are really good for being able to access those things wherever they're accessing them from. You know, whether that's just sort of out there in the ethereal realms or whether it's somewhere buried deep in your own subconscious, that's a good and useful thing for those teacher spirits to be able to do. So this is really an intro to um, familiars and to spirit work. I know that we've got more to cover in terms of how to reach out to spirits, if that's new for you, um, how to make spirit houses or how to make those offerings. Um, I have done quite a lot of writing about spirit work. This is one of those topics that I am supremely passionate about, so I'm sure that we're gonna end up covering more about spirit work in videos to come. I would love to be able to dive into specific questions that you've got about spirit work. And um, I know that between the blog and this channel, we're gonna get into all kinds of interesting spirit conversations. Um, but that is all that I've got for you today on this topic. So just consider this the tip of the iceberg and we're gonna get in deeper. <laughs> um, that was probably n not a great metaphor. Subscribe, like, share, do all the things, and talk to your spirits. Say hi for me, and I will see you here next Monday at noon. Bye, guys! <laughs>